Why in the world would a seminary, a professor, not want us to read about a family that's standing up for God? Why is this book hidden from us? Why are we not reading this book? Why are we not encouraged by this book? And I'm going to tell you why. You see, Europeans always said, besides teaching us how to read, it was three things that you, would, you should never teach the Hebrews, that you should never teach blacks. Along with not teaching them to read, don't ever, ever teach them the Bible the way it's really supposed to be. Don't ever teach them. When we was in slavery, they gave us selected scriptures. They ain't teach us all this, and they for sure ain't taught us about Maccabees and the Maccabees in Judah Mountain. Maccabees. Because we would have saw ourselves. Don't teach them how to read. Don't teach them the Bible like it's supposed to really be. Don't teach them business. Ooh, put them through your schools and teach them how to be workers, but don't teach them how to open and own their own businesses. Don't teach them how to be entrepreneurs. I'm trying to give you something here. Don't teach them Bible. Don't teach them business. Don't ever teach them economics, learn how to handle money and invest. Don't teach them Bible. Don't teach them business. And the third thing, you never teach a Hebrew. You don't teach them war. Don't teach them how to come together and fight as a group. All three of these things with the ability to read, if you teach them the Bible, if you give them the, how to, the opportunity to learn business and you teach them or allow them to learn war, oh God, then a shift is going to happen. You know, God, it's a lot of things on my heart, and I just want to pour it out. I'm looking out the window into the sky. Worthy are you, Lord, you're the sovereign God. You know everything, and you hear me. I know you can see, and you near me. I'm waiting on you, Lord, time is passing by.
I just want the beat to just, I just want the beat to just minister to you for a moment.
Proverbs 23, 25. Thy father and thy mother shall be glad, and she that bear thee shall rejoice. We would like to say happy Mother's Day to all of our mothers who have made an impact to so many lives. Thank you for tuning in to the Philadelphia Christian Church live stream service, and shalom to everyone watching from our School of the Hebrews YouTube channel. This broadcast is also available on our Facebook page. We pray for the presence of God to be in your homes or wherever you are. Right now, it's time for the good news of the week. Congratulations to Mr. Kowalski and Natasha Jenkins on their eighth year anniversary. Kowalski says that May 12th is going to make eight years of strength, growth, and a lot of blessings. We have a lifetime ahead of us and the most important thing is that we keep Yahweh first. We will continue to keep him first in our lives, so we thank him for that date and many more to come. Lord knows I love my little family. Love Kowalski. Happy anniversary, y'all. Let's give a happy birthday to Eugenia McCoy, who turned 40 years old on May 5th. She says she loves the whole Philly family, and thank you all. Happy birthday, Jeannie. Rejoice with us, Philly family, as we praise Yahweh for our youngest son, Christian Joseph, who turned 12 on Friday, May 8th. We love you, son. Love Deacon Brent and Sister Shirley Joseph. Russ and Taylor would like to wish a happy first birthday to Olivia Rain. From Mama and Dada, have a happy birthday, Olivia. Let's give a happy birthday to Zaria Pitts, who turned two years old on April 27th. Happy birthday, Zaria, from the Pitts family. Now available, Covered by the Blood t-shirts by True Vision. Order yours today. They are $15, available in both black and white. If interested, message at True Vision on Facebook. Remember to purchase our stream, Rejoice With Me by Passion, now available on Spotify, Google Play, iTunes, and Apple Music. Come and rejoice with me today. If you have any good news, birthdays, anniversaries, new business, or a testimony, send it to phillyoffice1 at yahoo.com to be featured on the good news of the week. We must receive it by 3 p.m. on Thursdays to be featured on Sundays and Tuesdays announcements. Church members and visitors are encouraged to tune in via live stream and share the link with your family, friends, and even co-workers as we continue to worship God in these adverse times. Church services will continue to be handled on a case-by-case -case basis as we monitor the developments of this pandemic. Philadelphia Christian Church will be updating its church membership records. If you have gone through membership class and become a member of Philadelphia, please send us a photo of yourself and your family. Please include your full name and address in the email and send that photo to phillyoffice1 at yahoo.com. That's phillyoffice1 at yahoo.com. To stay up to date with us, please sign up to the Philly Network and receive text messages right to your phone. Sign up by texting at PhillyNet to the phone number 81010. That's at PhillyNet to the phone number 81010. We also encourage you to download the Philly app to receive push notifications with updates and watch previous sermons, Hebrew nuggets, and past conferences. The app is available on both Android and Apple devices. Go to your app store and search for PCC Lafayette or click on the download app button via the church's website. Don't forget we have various ways of giving. You can text to give by texting the amount you would like to give to the phone number 337-214-0707. That's 337-214-0707. 
We have online giving by opening another tab on your browser and visiting our website at philadelphiacc.org and then click on the giving tab. You can also give via our app. To those watching live from YouTube, remember to hit the like button, subscribe to the channel, and also hit the bell to be notified of live sermon messages and new videos. Saints of God, we are glad you are tuning in with us today from all four corners of the world. Right now, let's stand to our feet right from your living room. Judah, it's worship time. Good evening, good evening. Shalom, brothers and sisters. We want to thank you all for joining us in to worship tonight. Our King, our Lord and Savior, Yahshua. Well, we just want to go into to the Lord in prayer right now. Father God, we just thank you for this day that you have made. We are rejoicing. We are excited. We are glad to be here. Father God, we just ask in the name of Jesus that you would come and meet us right where we are. As we lift your name up from the earth, pray that you would draw us into your presence. Draw us into a place we're longing to be in. In your presence, Lord God, there is joy, there is freedom. There is life. There is revelation. God, speak to our hearts as we magnify your name, as we acknowledge you tonight as being our Savior and our Lord. Have your way, Lord God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Come on, give God some glory. We want to welcome all visitors. Come on, members, show some love to the visitor. If you're a visitor tonight, come on, put some hearts, put some likes, put your name. We want to welcome you for joining us. We want to thank you for joining us tonight as we worship our Lord. Well, put your hands together. As we gather and lift up how mighty he is, he's a mighty king, amen? Very simple song. Song says, Lord, you're mighty. Lord, you're mighty. Say, Lord, you're mighty. Lord, you're mighty. Lord, Lord, you're mighty, Lord, you're mighty, Lord, you're mighty, say, Lord, you're mighty, Lord, you're mighty, Lord, you're mighty, Lord, you're mighty, oh, Lord, how excellent is your name. Your glory above the heavens and the earth. When I think of all you made, the sun, the moon, and the stars, and no praise is high enough to express how great you are.
Lift them up, there's no one like Yahweh. Lift them up, there's no one like Jesus. 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 There's no one like Yahshua. 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 Yeah. He's worthy of the praise. He worthy of the honor, he worthy of the glory, oh, he worthy of my praise, and he's worthy of the honor, and he's worthy of the glory, and he's worthy of the praise, yes, he is, hallelujah, he's, he's worthy to be praised, he's the God we sing about, the God we shout about, the God we lift our hands about, because he deserves it all. He's great. And not only that he's great, he's greatly to be praised. His greatness is unsearchable, and we acknowledge that tonight. So we, I just want to encourage everyone to join me on this song as we lift them up all around the world in unity. For the song says, how great is our God? Sing with me. Every tongue from the fruit of your lips. Come 
time. See how great is our God. Sing with me how great is our God. And all will see how great, how great is our God. Name at this moment, God. Name. 
name above, name above all names, worthy of all praise. And our hearts will sing how great is our God. One more time, we're going to leave y'all out with this one. Name above all names, and worthy of all praise, and our hearts will sing how great is our God, is our God. Yes, God. Come on, lift him up. He's worthy to be praised. Amen. No one like him in all the earth. Yes. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. How many people know we have a great God, an awesome God? Yes. That there's nobody like him. Amen. We have a have a good, good father. Amen. And Hallelujah. We thank God that we that we love by him. Amen. So we worship him. We lift him up. We give him glory. Hallelujah. There's nobody like him. Amen. He, he loves us so much. Amen. He loves us so much. And hallelujah. He's so perfect in, in all of his ways. Hey God, he's just a whoo, my God, my God. He's just a, a good, good father. Anybody knows that? He's a good father, amen. He's not like our daddies here on earth. Hey, God, hallelujah. Hey, God, hallelujah. Hallelujah. Such a good, good father. Thank you. Come on, Zion, just call him what he is. Worship him. You are perfect in all He's always been perfect to us. You are perfect in all of your ways. He's never done us wrong. He's perfect. You are perfect in all of your ways. Come on, come on. To us. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You are perfect in all of your ways. Always been perfect to us. You are perfect in all of your ways. Hallelujah. call him father. Come on, come on. Tell him what he is. You're a good, good father. Ooh, that was heavy. It's who you are. Thank you. It's who you are. My God. It's who you are and I'm loved by you. It's who I am. Thank you, Jesus. It's who I am. Ooh. Come on, make that declaration. you're loved. It's who I am. You're loved by him. It's who I am. Ooh. It's who I am. So we worship you, Abba. We give you your glory this evening. We thank you for being a father to the fatherless and a mother to the motherless. We thank you for always being there for us, never leaving us nor forsaking us being with us, low until the end of the age. We thank you, God, that some mamas might turn their back on their children, God, and some daddies will walk away, God, but, but you'll never walk away from us. You'll never leave us, Daddy, and we worship you, Lord God. You are, hallelujah, you're so faithful to us, God, and we're engraving in the palms of your hands, and we thank you so much for that. You're just such a good, good father, and we worship you tonight. We thank you tonight. 
for loving us even when we didn't love you as we are. Such a good father. Ooh. Putting us before you, you're such a, such a good father. So, who God, we thank you. We thank you. We thank you. Send down a father's anointing upon us. Help us to see how much of a good father you are. Hey, my God. Always taking care of your children. Giving us the good we need. And the chastisement, hallelujah, we need even more. You're such a good, good father. Woo. Now speak to us, your children. Gather us round your table. And raise us like we ought to be raised. Talk to us as a father talks to his children tonight. Bring us close under your arms, Daddy, and teach us the way that we should go and the way we should stay away from. Some of our real daddies ain't been dead and been locked up. And, but we thank you that we have a heavenly Father that'll teach us every single thing that we know that'll make us wise beyond our years, God, and wiser than our teachers and wiser than the ancients and wiser than our enemies. We thank you, Daddy, that you are the only father we need. We pray right now that you would father us as a people, as a people. Who Father us. Adopt us into the beloved protect us and provide for us and nurture and care for us be that for us as a nation tonight and speak to us through your word and bind the enemy out of this place loose your anointing your healing and your grace in Jesus Yahshua Jesus name we pray amen that's good. That's good. Because <laughs> that's what we need. That's what we need right now. Woo. Come on. Wrap me, please. Wrap me in your arms. Wrap us in your arms. Hey. Wrap us in your arms. My God, my God. Take me long. To that secret place. I want to be near to you. I can be with you. Come on. And you can make me laugh. Yeshua. Like Grab me in your arms. Please, please, please. Grab me in your arms. Thank you. Grab us in your Father, bless us as we get ready to do the word, God, and your people are attentive to your voice, and I pray that I decrease and you increase, and they hear the Father's voice, and I pray in the name of Yahshua, those that need to be saved, be saved, and all that need to be edified, be edified, and sanctified, and one day you return and we be glorified with you. We thank you for it. In Yahshua, Jesus' name we pray. Amen, amen, amen. Hallelujah. Come on, just lift up your voice. Just say hallelujah wherever you are. Just say hallelujah. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Brothers, good job, amen. Praise God for y'all. Y'all such a blessing, amen. Hallelujah. And wherever you are, amen, don't forget, amen, to... Uh, snatch up Minister Bryant's EP, amen. Uh, rejoice with me, amen. I guarantee you, you start listening to it, you're not going to be able to stop, amen. And so uh, it's just a, just a blessing, amen. And, and 
and our whole team, we just come together and we, we put that together, amen, and Brian did the beats and Carlos was in there on some of them songs, amen, and, and so we praise God for that, and, and so uh, you don't want to miss that, hallelujah, and, and when, you, when you touch on that EP, amen, uh, you'll find that we got other music, amen, we got other musicians that's on the label, amen, and hallelujah, we got a, a voice, hey God, you can, he's got his own EP, his own, he, uh, uh, we have a, a Kingdom Jewels, amen, a Leah Simone, amen, War Cry, hey God, we, so, so when, you, when you touch down on Rejoice With Me, amen, go ahead and, and visit all the other uh, artists and, and the things we have, Miss Chansey, amen, and, and so hallelujah, just, you want to, you want to check all of that out, amen, and Leah Delight, hallelujah, glory to God, and so, did I miss anybody else, J Malvo, amen, hallelujah, and so, uh, you want to check that out, amen, such a blessing, such a blessing to be around, amen, such uh, servants of the most high God, amen, and so, glory to God, and so, all of your heart, hey God, <laughs> if you search, with all your heart, amen, hallelujah, and so listen, we're going to get going, and, um, but just check that out, check those albums out, those EPs out, amen, and you'll for sure uh, be blessed, uh, this Sunday is going to be coming up, and they're going to be making some adjustments, amen, with the COVID-19 laws, amen, but we're going to keep everything pretty much the same as far as having church, amen, via the different platforms we have, amen, Hallelujah, tell your neighbor, don't move too soon, amen. Uh, don't move when they move, <laughs> move when God moves, amen. And so that's what we're going to do. So we, we're going to continue to have service, amen, uh, the way we have in it, amen. I know that they wanted to try to do something where you can have a portion of your congregants or, or, or whatever. Uh, who are we going to choose to have in here if we can't have everybody in here, amen. And so... Uh, we're just going to keep it the way it is for now, amen. We might have a few more, amen, worshipers or whatnot with us, amen, uh, to help, amen, get the message out. But, but we're going to keep everything pretty much the same, amen. Just, uh, just tarry with me while God works this out, amen. And so uh, that's for our online family as well as a, the church body. And so with that being said, I'm going to go ahead and get cranked up, saints, um, if you take your Bibles and turn with me to Hebrews 11, Hebrews 11 and verse 34, we're going to get going. Amen. And uh, I believe that's all the announcements that I have. Brian Lewis, y'all can think of anything? All right, all right. I think that's it. Ministers, deacons, y'all got anything? Amen. Y'all good, Minister Ann? Sam? Jay Malvo, y'all good? All right. Well, we're going to get going. Deacon, you good? All right, all right, all right. We're going to get going. Uh, Hebrews 11 and, and 34. Amen. And uh, we're going to get off into this word. And the Bible says in Hebrews, amen, just talking about faith, that hallelujah, through faith, they quenched the violence of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, out of weakness were made strong, waxed valiant in flight, turned to flight the armies of the aliens. Women received their dead raised to life again, and others were tortured, not accepting deliverance that they might obtain a better resurrection. And so um, we're going to stop right there. Father, bless your word and, and fill me up with the Holy Ghost, O King, and, and anoint me and uh, bless me to deliver your word with your voice. Let the shout of the King be amongst us tonight. In Yahshua, Jesus' name, amen. So, saints, we've been in the book of Hebrews, amen, uh, preaching to the Hebrews, amen, about a new covenant faith. And uh, we've gotten ourselves into Hebrews 11, where they actually kind of go through the heroes of faith. And so we've been looking at Abel and Enoch and Noah and Abraham and Isaac and, and Jacob, and Joseph and Moses and Joshua and Rahab, and then the writer of the Hebrews, he switches gears a little bit and goes for more detailed, personal, name-by-name -name list of faith, amen, to a more general description where he begins to talk about, amen, the accomplishments of faith. And so we've been going through that, and we've been uh, talking about the exploits of faith. Say that with me, the exploits of faith, 
Amen. And, and an exploit is a daring, bold, heroic, and brilliant deed accomplished in the face of insurmountable odds. It's when you do something great, amen, that's what you call an exploit. And we name this the exploits of faith because when you have faith, amen, faith will allow you to do great things, greater things, amen, hallelujah, uh, than these, Jesus says, will we who believe in him do, amen. And so in Daniel 11, 32, he says, and such as do wickedly against the covenant shall he corrupt by flatterers, talking about the enemy. He says, but the people that do know their God shall be strong and do exploits, or great exploits. And so we've been going through a few points, pulling out, amen, some points from this latter end of Hebrews 11. And we talked about the people of faith subduing kingdoms and rotting righteousness and obtaining promises, amen, and then we switched gears and talked about, amen, how they stopped the mouths of lions. And we saw that this was an allusion to Daniel, amen, uh, the prophet in the lion's den. And then we talked about them quenching the violence of fire and saw this was, amen, a suggestion, amen, of the three Hebrew boys, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, in the fiery furnace during the reign of Nebuchadnezzar, amen. And so we come to this third point um, in verse uh, 34 and it says that they escaped the edge of the sword they escaped the edge of the sword and that's what we're going to talk about tonight amen and while we talk about this point escape the edge of the sword just want to tell you that the rest of the verse kind of goes together with that particular precept amen so it would say escape the edge of the sword out of weakness were made strong Wax valiant and fight, turn to flight the armies of the aliens. And so all of these kind of go together, at least in my study time, with this, this, this truism, escape the edge of the sword. And I'd have to agree with F.F. F. Bruce, amen, uh, the theologian, amen, and the uh, uh, Christian leader. He says that he couldn't help but to think about a certain person as he looked at uh, verse 34, and as he lumped together all of these precepts about escaping the sword, about uh, being made strong in weakness and wax valiant in fight and turn, amen, to flight the armies of, of the aliens, of the strangers, it would say in the Greek, he couldn't help to think about just one person, amen, who had accomplished all those things at one time. And he's talking about the heroine uh, uh, the female hero, heroine, by the name of Judith. Judith. Somebody say Judith. All right. And uh, so tonight, in agreement with F.F. F. Bruce, by just looking at this, amen, I see it, and I see the story of Judith in the Apocrypha, amen. I'm going to talk about Judith, amen. And I understand that a lot of believers who was raised in the church, amen, you know nothing about the book of Judith, amen, and the Apocrypha. It's kind of like the Maccabees because it's written in the same book during the same intertestamentary period, amen. So I'm going to take this opportunity and teach you the book of Judith. And I'm going to kind of do a crash course through it, amen. So in about an hour, we're going to look at it, amen, and you're going to know, amen, the basic structure of it. You're going to know the story of it, amen. And so when you read it on your own, it's going to kind of make a little bit more sense. So help me God, amen. And so we're going to talk about the book of Judith, Judith tonight, and we're going to talk about it in relation to Hebrews 34, because in her life, you're going to see that she escaped the edge of the sword, out of weakness was made strong, waxed valiant in fight, and turned to flight the armies of the aliens. Amen. In this book, amen, you're going to see a lot of biblical theology, and you're going to see a lot of encouragement. Amen. And if those, amen, who've been led by the Ashkenazis and want to stay away from our historical books, amen, as we go through this and we read large portions of the scripture in the book of Judith, I want you to find something that's anti-Bible in this book. All you're going to see is God glorifying, God exalting, God magnifying, faith building up theology in this book of Judith. It makes you kind of wonder why it's been hid from us all this time. And so we're going to talk about it, amen. And the book is awesome, amen. 
In case you don't know what the word Judith means, amen, in the Hebrew is Yahudit, amen, which is the, the feminine form of the masculine name Judah. So you would name your son Judah, but if you want to keep it the same, you would name your daughter what? Judith. Amen. And the names mean the same. They mean praise. Amen. They mean praise. Praise Yah. Amen. Uh, somebody say Judith. Amen. All right. And so um, it's kind of hard to tell the exact setting of the book. By setting, I mean the time and place in which it was written. But myself, along with other biblical scholars, we believe that this was after the Babylonian captivity, during the time of the second temple, during the times of Nehemiah, of Ezra, during the time, I believe, shortly before the Maccabees. Amen. But that's debatable. Amen. It's really hard to tell when exactly it's written. But in spite of that, the book is great in regards to faith and building up the people of Yah. And I can see why the enemy would love to keep this book away from the real biblical Hebrews. Amen. Because just like the Maccabees, just like those other uh, truths we've been learning in our identity. Amen. Got an email from a woman of God. Amen. Just the other day she said, hallelujah, through the teachings of, 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 of who we are, it feels like I can accomplish anything. All right. And that's what Yah wants us to do. The people of God, the people that know their God, shall be strong and do what? Do great exploits. And so in this book, amen, we're going to get to it here in a second, is a book of faith, courage, a love for God. It's a book for the, for the love of God's people. It's a book with a lot of adventure in it, excitement. It's a high level of espionage. Uh, double agent, CIA type of stuff, covert, covert operations, behind enemy lines. It's, it's just a wonderful book. And so tonight, we're going to do a crash course through it. Amen. And it's the book of Judith, which is in the Apocrypha. And so let's begin, amen, uh, this great book. Amen. And if you have friends or family who want to get deeper in the Bible, text them right now and tell them, Pastor O is teaching out of a book that's been hidden from us from a long time. Tell them to tune in, even now, amen, because we're going deep. We're going in to the book of Judith, amen. And so let's go straight into that. So the book of Judith starts off with a king, a king of Assyria, that lives in Nineveh, which is the capital. And his name is Nabuchodonosor. Nabuchodonosor, Amen. I'm going to call him what they used to call my brother when we were small. I'm going to just call him Cho Cho. Amen. Nabu Cho Dinosaur. We call him Cho Cho. I'm just joking. I'm just joking. But some relate him as they put this text in, 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 in uh, modern English. They relate him to Nebuchadnezzar. All right. I don't agree with that translation. Um, it's, a, it's a different name. It's a different time period. It's a different nation. Nebuchadnezzar never was a king over Assyria. He was a king of Babylon. <laughs> and so it's a different time, different place, different name. So I would not ascribe to putting this Nabuchodonosor uh, as being the same person as Nebuchadnezzar, unless there was another Nebuchadnezzar down the line, amen, Nebuchadnezzar the 12th or the 13th. But besides that, this is a different person than the one who was in Babylon in the days of Daniel. Well, this king, he goes to war all right, with some other nations, and he needs some assistance. And so he issued out, issues out a clarion call to the nations around him, Israel included, Judah included. Um, this is after we come back from Babylon. We're in our land. And so he issues out this call, and he says, I need some help. I'm going to war. Uh, 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 Cho Cho says, I need some help. And so none of the nations answer him. Nobody come to his assistance. Nobody come to his aid. Amen. But he goes to war anyway. And this... Uh, 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 Nabuchodonosor, amen, he is victorious in his battle. And before he comes back home, he tells himself and his men, he says, all those nations that didn't come to my assistance, that didn't come to my aid, I'm going to get them back. And I'm going to make sure that I punish them for not coming to help me 
when I was gone to war. This is what this Assyrian king says. And so he sends one of his top generals by the name of um, Hollow Ferns. Hollow Ferns. And, and I think there's an O that goes uh, right after the L, Brent. Amen. But we can correct that later. But it's Hollow Fern. Hollow Ferns or Hollow Furnace. And his general, he sends him out. Deacon sends him out. He said, them people didn't come help me when I needed. Israel didn't come. I'm sending out my general. We're going to destroy all those nations. All right? And so his general goes out. And he begins to destroy those nations one by one, destroying the nation, their temples, their groves, their altars, their false gods. Amen? And he tells them to stop worshiping these other idols and worship Nabuchodonosor as the one and true God. All right? He destroys those nations, destroys those false temples, but he places and sets in the Syrian king as the God that they should be worshiping. And so in Judith chapter 4, verse 1, Israel, Judah, catches wind that this general is coming. And so let's look at what happens in the book of Judith. Judith 4.1. Now the children of Israel that dwelt in Judea heard all that hollow furnace, the chief captain of Nebuchadnezzar, king of the Assyrians, had done to the nations. And after what manner he had spoiled all their temples and brought them to naught. Therefore they were exceeding afraid of him and were troubled for Jerusalem and for the temple of the Lord their God. For they were newly returned, watch this, from captivity. So this is after Babylon. They were newly returned from captivity, all right? And all the people of Judea were lately gathered together. And the vessels and the altar and the house were sanctified after the profanation. This was after uh, uh, the temple was profaned. And so they said, man, we just got our stuff back together. We don't need another general coming through to destroy us. We just getting back home. So Judah gathered together, and they prepared for war. And they began to seek the Most High in prayer and fasting for help. And if you look at Judith 4 and 11, look what it says. It says, thus every man and woman and the little children and the inhabitants of Jerusalem fell before the temple that was rebuilt by Ezra and Nehemiah and cast ashes upon their heads and spread out their sackcloth before the face of the Lord, the Most High, also, they put sackcloth about the altar, and they cried to God, the God of Israel, all with one consent. Look at the unity here. Earnestly, that he would not give their children for a prey and their wives for a spoil and the cities of their inheritance to destruction and the sanctuary to profanation again and reproach and for the nation to rejoice at, for the nations to rejoice at. So God heard their prayers and looked upon their afflictions, for the people fasted many days in all Judea and Jerusalem before the sanctuary of the Lord Almighty. So how's the book of Judith so far? Is there anything anti-biblical in it? Huh? All you hear is fasting. All you hear is prayer. All you hear is they calling on the Most High for danger that's coming in. If you see something or hear something, you let me know. But I'm telling you, like all the other books, amen, it's going to lift up and magnify the Most High God. All right? So when the general, Hollow, Hollow Furnace, heard the people prepared for war, all right, the other nations he, he went through, he beat up about four or five of them. All right? When the next ones down the road heard that he was coming and what he did to the first few, watch this, ministers, they surrendered. Amen. And when they surrendered, he walked in their city, destroyed their temples and everything like that, but he kept them alive. And so he got used to this pattern of nations and cities surrendering to him. But when he came to Israel, he heard that Judah prepared for war. And in the book of Judah, it said he was angry because after his first few victories, all the nations began to surrender. So he asked the people of Moab. He asked the people of Ammon, who are the children of Lot. Ammon and Moab are the children of Lot. All right. He asked them, who are these people? That even though I'm stronger, I'm bigger, I have more men, more weapons, and I'm beating all these nations, who are these people that are still preparing for war? All right. Look at Judah 5 and 3. Watch God tell you a little bit about yourself in this chapter. And he said unto them, this is the general, 
Tell me now, ye sons of Cana, who this people is that dwelleth in the hill country? And what are the cities that they, are, that they inhabit? And what is the multitude of their army? And wherein is their power and strength? And what king is set over them? Or what captain of their army? And why have they determined not to come and meet me and surrender to me? more than all the inhabitants of the West. The general said, tell me who these people are. Who do they think they are? Why haven't they surrendered to me like all the other nations have? Who's their king? Who's their captain? What's, what power they have? Who living in their cities? What makes them so special that they will not surrender to uh, uh, the king of Assyria and to his top general? And I have in my notes here, Never ask a question that you don't want to know the answer to. All right? And the Moabites and the Ammonites, they had been living with Israel for so long, so they know the children of Israel, actually related to the children of Israel through Lot and Abraham, amen, because Ammon and Moab are the descendants of Lot, amen. It's a bad story, amen, through his own particular daughters or whatnot. But, but Ammon or, 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 or the Moabite king steps up, and answers the general. And he tells the general who these people are. All right? And in Judah 5 and 5, look what he tells the general. Then said Achior, the captain of the sons uh, of Ammon, let my Lord now hear a word from the mouth of thy servant, and I will declare unto thee the truth concerning this people, which dwelleth near thee and inhabited the hill countries. And there shall no lie come out of my mouth, of the mouth of thy servant. This people are descended of the Chaldeans. And what you need to know about the Hebrews is, is that Abraham lived in Ur of the Chaldees before he came to the promised land. And they sojourned heretofore in Mesopotamia because they would not follow the gods of their fathers. Abraham left because he didn't want to stay in idolatry serving the false gods of the Babylonians, which were in the land of Chaldea. For they left the way of their ancestors and worshiped who? The God of heaven, who is the only true and living God. That's why they left Ur. That's why they left Chaldea, the God whom they knew. So they cast them out from the face of their false gods, and they fled into Mesopotamia and sojourned there many days. Then their God commanded them to depart from the place where they sojourned and to go into the land of Cana where they dwelt and were increased with gold and silver and with very much cattle. All right, the Moab king is telling them our story and how we got in, with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the land of Cana, and riches and wealth began to flow into our people. We call it the blessings of Abraham. Verse 10, but when a famine covered all the land of Cana, they then went down into Egypt and sojourned there while they were nourished and became there in Egypt a great multitude so that one could not number their nation. This is the king of Moab, telling the general who those people are who have not surrendered to him. Therefore, the king of Egypt rose up against them and dealt subtly with them and brought them low with laboring in brick and made them slaves. Then they cried unto their God, and he smote all the land of Egypt with incurable plagues. So the Egyptians cast them out of their sight. Out of their sight. And God dried the Red Sea before them. Imagine the general listening to this. God destroyed Egypt through them. God dried the Red Sea. Come on, it's getting better. God dried the Red Sea before them and brought them to Mount Sinai and Kadesh Barnea, which is the wilderness, and cast forth all that dwelt in the wilderness out. So they dwelt in the land of the Amorites. And they destroyed by their strength all them of Esiban. And passing over Jordan, they possessed all the hill country. And they cast forth before them the Canaanite, the Perizzite, the Jebusite, the Sechemite, and all the Gergesites, 
and they dwelt in the country many days. The general is listening while this king is telling them all the nations that they beat after Egypt, after God dried up the Red Sea. The general is still listening. And whilst they sinned not before their God, watch this, they prospered. Let me read that again. And while they sinned not before their God, they prospered. Because the God that hated iniquity was with them. Stop right there. How y'all like the book of Judah so far? Who does it lift up? Who does it glorify? What type of theology it is, is it presenting? Right there it's presenting a holy God. A holy God that hates iniquity but loves his people to walk in righteousness. And it also teaches the Hebrews that when we are with God, living in the oracles of God, the judgments of God, the word of God, that we will prosper. Amen. As long as we serve in God... Something has got to break. Amen. We will never stay in a troubled, cast down, burdened, oppressive, hallelujah, downtrodden state when we serve in the most high God. As long as they serve their God and stayed away from iniquity, they prospered. All right? Verse 18. But when they departed from the way which he appointed them, they were destroyed in many battles, very sore, and were led captives into a land that was not theirs. And the temple of their God was cast to the ground. And their cities were taken by the enemies. So right here we have here a time stamp. Where the king of Moab is telling us, amen, the curses of Deuteronomy 28 and the blessings as well. When we don't listen, curses going to come. When we act right. Blessings going to come. He actually talks about, amen, how the temple was destroyed and how the city was taken. That's a time stamp. This is after the Babylonian captivity. Amen. And so he goes on. He says in 19, and this is very important to us as Hebrews right now. Okay. But now are they returned to their God. <laughs> you hear that, Deacon? But now. They are returned to their God. Watch this. And are come up from the places where they were scattered and have possessed Jerusalem again, where their sanctuary is, and are seated in the hill country, for it was desolate. You see, anytime you return to the Lord, the Lord puts you back where you first left him. Amen. He's going to put you back in the hill country. He's going to put you back in the place of blessing. Amen. Hallelujah. Look, we continue. Look what he says in 20. Now, therefore, my Lord, pay attention to this closely. Now, therefore, my Lord, the king or the captain of the Moabites is talking to the general right here. He says, now, therefore, my Lord and governor, if there be any error against this people and they sin against their God, let us consider that this shall be their ruin, and let us go up, and we shall overcome them. Let's look close at them, and let us see if they serving him or not, if they worshiping him or not, if they've given their heart to him or not, and if there be some error in them, and they serving other gods, and they not pressing towards the mark, if they not doing hallelujah God, and they doing something else, then let's go, let's go get them. Let's run up on them, amen, and guess what? We gonna have the victory. This is what he's telling this general. We will overcome them if they're not serving the most high. That's a no-brainer. But look at the next verse, 21. But if there be no iniquity in their nation, let my Lord now, Pass by, lest their Lord defend them and their God before them, and we become a reproach before all the world. You hear what he's telling them, that minister? Deacon? He's saying, if they're not serving God, let's go. We're going to wipe them out easily. But if they're serving the most high God, whoo, if they done put down the idols and those idol, idolatry, iniquitous ways are not in them, he tells that general, then we better keep on moving. We better pass by. Because if they serve in God and you go up in that, their Lord will defend them. 
their God will be for them. And you see, my Bible tells me, if God be for me, who can be against me? Has the book of Judah told us anything that's any, anything anti-biblical thus far? Oh, no. Oh, no. It's lifting up the most high. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And he says, let's pass by. Why? Lest we become a reproach before the world. This little city, this little nation, Judea, is going to shame us before the whole world if we play with them. All right? Let's keep on moving. Let's keep on moving. All right? Now, your boy, the general, he gets smart. He don't receive, amen, what the chief or the king of Moab says. All right? And by way of sidebar, before I get into this, amen, as we, the Hebrews in America, begin to call upon the Most High, all right, and seek him, all right, with our whole heart, ain't God? This is what God's going to have to tell those nations that's messing with us, pass by. Don't mess with them. Let the Lord defend them, all right? And let the Lord be for them. And I want you to pay attention to what the king of Moab said. He said, if there be no iniquity in them. Now watch this. The blessing of the new covenant is, is that when we get saved in Yahshua, what happens to all of our sins? It's forgiven. It's under the blood. It's on the cross. Israel, if you get saved, if you turn to Yahshua, if we as a nation turn to our Messiah with all of our hearts, not a man, not a, not a, not a, a fake Yahshua, but a real Yahshua who was born of a virgin, lived a sinless life, who is the incarnate God-man, Yahshua HaMashiach, the Messiah, the one that, hallelujah, the Bible prophesies, the one who Yahshua said, if, if, if David is his son, why does David call him Lord? And we know the answer to that. We know the answer to that. The answer is written into what Yahshua said, before Abraham was, I am. This is not the son of a man we're dealing with here. This is the son of God. This is the second person of the Godhead. Before him was nothing else. He's the only begotten of the Father. And when we come to him and love him and accept him, admitting our sins, believing in his death, burial, and resurrection, our iniquity, though it be, though it be as red as scarlet, will be washed as what? As white as snow. Our sins will be cast as far from us as the east is from the west into the sea of the forgetfulness so that when God looks at us who are saved, who are in Yahshua, who are Hebrews, he sees no iniquity. All he sees is the righteousness of Yahshua upon us. He says if there be no iniquity in them, you better pass by. You better pass by. In the Hebrews, in the new covenant, the blood washes all iniquity. He became sin who knew no sin, that we might become the righteousness of God. You see? But your boy don't understand if God be for somebody. He don't understand that. So in Judah 6, 2, look what he says. He says, and who art thou, Achior, and the hirelings of Ephraim, that thou hast prophesied against us today? And has said that we should not make war with the people of Israel because their God will defend them. Who is God but Nabu Chodanasor? Who's God but our king? This is what this boy is saying. And while I, as I'm reading that, Vinny, watch this. As I'm reading that, Brent, watch this. Malvo, watch this. As I'm reading that and he says something as prideful and arrogant and as blasphemous as this, I already know how the battle going to go. <laughs> I'm like them children. I'm reading. I said, ooh, boy, you in trouble. You in trouble. Who is God? Huh? And who is God but what? A man? Well, you about to get it. All right? But he tells Achior, as you read the book of Ju Ju Judah, he tells Achior. He's so mad with Achior. And he tells him, I'm going to deal with you for coming here talking about Israel like that, going through their whole history in front of me and all my generals, about to try to make us scared or something. Well, I'm, I'm about to deal with you. But he said, I'm not going to deal with you right now. 
He said, I'm going to deal with you with Israel. After I finish with them, the sword I use on them, I'm going to use on you. And you're not going to see my face till after I'm victorious over Israel. This is what he tells us, boy. He says, so the next time you see me, it's on. All right? Next time you see me, it's on. In fact, he tells his team, he said, guess what? He said, fellas, in fact, get him away from us, this boy bike chief. Get him away from us. Drop him to one of the cities of Israel since he loved Israel so much. And so they dropped him to a city in Israel. Amen. The city that was called, uh, uh, hallelujah, uh, Beth, Bethula. Amen. And we'll see it here in a second again. Beth, Bethulia. Amen. And, and so they drop him over there. So if you look at Judah 6 and 17, the story continued. Just stay with me. This is so good. And he answered and declared unto them the words of the council of, of Holofernes. And so he's in uh, the children of Israel city, Bethulia, all right, Bethulia. And so he's there. And he began to speak to the children of Israel. And all the words that he had spoken in the midst of the princes of Asher and whatsoever uh, the general had spoken proudly against the house of Israel. So he told them what he told the general and what the general said in return. In verse 18, then the people fell down and worshiped God and cried unto God saying, O Lord God of heaven, behold their pride and pity the lowest state of our nation and look upon the face of those that are sanctified unto thee this day. All right. So they knew, just like we knew, he was in trouble, all right? But in the book of Judah, I know this ain't Sunday, but stay with me, the Edomites show up again. The enemies of Israel show up again. And Edom actually goes to this general, amen, hollow furnace, and tells the general how to defeat Judah. There's a particular city right in his way that Beth Ulea is right in his way. And if he can get through that, he can get through the land of Judah, amen, and tear it up. But he has to go through this city, all right? And so he's encamping out there in the city. And Edom, the Edomites come and they say, it's no problem. We can get you through this city. We're going to tell you the weakness of the city, all right? And so they tell the general, our friends, the Edomites, the sons of Esau, Tell the general in 712, remain in thy camp. Keep all your men and your army and let thy servants, the Edomites, get into their hands the fountain of water which issued forth of the foot of the mountain. For all the inhabitants of beth Beth-Ulea, have their water dense, so shall thirst kill them. And they shall give up their city, and we and our people shall go up to the tops of the mountains that are near, and will camp upon them to watch that none go out of the city. So you see what the Edomites do? They say, they say, General, you ain't got to go in there. We know where the water supply of the city is. So you besiege them, and they can't come out for water. We're going to stop up the fountain underneath the city that they still drinking water. We're going to stop the water. Edomites show them what the water source is. And so the Edomites go in there with the general's men. They stop up the fountain of water. The city has no water. They done filled up some, some cisterns, some, some little vessels of water, but they all run out. And 34 days pass, and the people are thirsty. And the Hebrews begin to murmur. And they tell the leaders to surrender. And the leaders are pressed by the people. And they ask the people, we will surrender, but give us five days. Give us five days for the most high to move, and then we're going to surrender. We, we, we thirsty, watching their children. They, they, they famish. It's, they thirsty, right? Enter the star of this particular book under the most high, a woman by the name of Judith. And Judith, amen was from the tribe of Simeon. She was a widow. Her husband had died. Amen. And he died suddenly. He was in one of their fields doing work, and all of a sudden, through exhaustion and heat, Judith's, husband's Manasseh, Judith, Judith's husband, Manasseh, died suddenly and unexpectedly. 
book of Judah says she took it hard. And in 8.4, she was a widow, and she stayed mourning for him a long time. So Judah was a widow in her house, watch this, three years and four months. Not talking to anybody. She didn't even get out of her mourning clothes. And she made her tent upon the top of the house. Didn't even want to go live on the inside of her house. She was grieving so hard. And she put sackcloth upon her lawns and wear her widow's apparel for three and a half years, y'all. Three years and four months. Still grieving. But the thing about Judith was, was that she was very godly, y'all. Come on, let me teach you about this book. Let me teach you about this Hebrew woman of God, amen, to strengthen our faith. Hebrews tells us that you, through faith, can escape the edge of sword. That when you're weak, you could be made strong. Hebrews tells us that through faith, you could fight a God and best the enemy. Through faith, you could put the flight, the armies of the aliens, amen. We're about to see a woman of God, a widow woman. Do something through faith in God that we've never been taught before. All right? And so she says here in, in 6, 7, it tells us a little bit about her. It says that she was not only godly, because she was really godly, she was also of a goodly countenance. What does that mean, Pastor? Keep reading. She was very beautiful to behold. You know how the Hebrew women are. All right? And when they say of her countenance, that's talking about the whole of her. She was pretty in the face, and she had a pretty, she, I'm going to keep going. She had a nice shape. And her husband Manasseh, watch this, so she was beautiful. And her husband Manasseh had left her gold, silver, men servants, maid servants, cattle, lands, and she remained upon them. She was godly. She was beautiful, nice shape. Huh? And she was wealthy. Her husband left her in a good position, baby. So for all the husbands out there, Hebrew men, if you had to go tonight, how would you leave your family? Do you have your house in order? You got some life insurance? You got a little will to talk about how your thing's going to go? Is your house in order? See, because a real man of God not going to leave his wife in a worse position than when she found him. Got them women selling chicken dinners, trying to figure out how to bury you. This man of God, Manasseh, left his wife with land, employees, men serving, maid serving, cattle, gold, silver. Let me charge you tonight. How you leaving your children and your wife if something happened to you? Get your house in order, man of God. You see, the Bible says she remained upon them. This means that she was not only beautiful, she was not only godly, she was not only wealthy, she wasn't no fool, man. She kept everything and took care of everything that he left her. She ain't lost nothing. It remained upon her. She ain't let no little fella walk up in there and sweep off her feet, amen, and, and not roll it in her bed. She ain't, let, she ain't did all that. All right? All right? In verse 8, and there was none that gave her an ill word. Nobody had anything bad to say about her or talk bad to her face. Why? Because she feared God greatly. Or oh, this Judith, this rich woman, this widow, this beautiful woman, amen, this woman of God, she heard about the five days time limit that the leaders of the city had put. And I'm going to quickly read her response to the leaders of the city because I just want you to hear it. I want you to hear it, amen, for yourself, a God, as this woman of God talks because it's going to teach us theology. It's going to teach us about who our God is and how we should relate to him. Watch this. In Judith 8, 11, look what she says. And they came unto her and said unto them, uh, and she said unto them, Hear me now, O ye governors, of the inhabitants of Beth Ulea. For your words that you have spoken before the people this day are not right. Touching this oath which you made and pronounced between God and you and have promised to deliver the city to our enemies unless within these days the Lord turn to help you. And now, who are you that you have tempted God this day? 
and stand instead of God among the children of men. And now try the, all, the Lord Almighty, but you shall never know anything. This is what she's saying. She said, who do you think you are? Who do you think you are to set a time limit on when God can help you and when he can't help you? How in the world are you going to say, God, if you don't do it in five days, then, man, get out of here, man. She said, who do you think you are? You don't understand the sovereignty of God. Don't you dare. She said, you're tempting God. You're saying, God, unless you do it in this amount of days, then it's, I'm not, uh, oh, no. Look, she continues. Watch this. In 14, for you cannot find the depth of the heart of man. Neither can you perceive the things that he thinks. You don't even know what's in the heart of your brother or your sister, of a regular man or a regular woman. You don't know what's in their heart and in their mind. That's what she's saying. And she says this, then how can you search out God? that had made all things and know his mind or comprehend his purpose. Why are you trying to play God, she's telling the governors. Don't you put a time limit on God. You can't figure out the mind of the brother that lived next door to you. How in the world are you going to figure out the mind of the most high that's seated in eternity? You see? And in the spirit, I think that some of us don't put time limits on God. In the spirit, I think that we don't tempted our God and say, God, if you don't do this and this, 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 let me tell you something, man. You don't know who the king is and who the subject is. You don't know who the master is and who the servant. We never tempt God like that. We always let God move how and when he want to move. I've come to realize in my walk, a God, of some 22 years of being a believer, I've come to realize in my walk that his timing is impeccable. And when I wanted it before his time, it was premature. Whoo! And when I wanted it after his time, it was too late. He always shows up on time. Might not be when you want it to, but it's going to be right on time. I'm telling you that's the way he served. That's the way, that's the way, he, that's the way he operates. See, and when you understand sovereignty, you know that. And so she give him a theological lesson about who's God and who's not. You see? And so she goes on. Nay, my brethren, provoke not the Lord our God to anger. For if he will not help us within these five days, he had power to defend us when he will. Even every day or to destroy us before our enemies, he's sovereign. He's going to do what he wants. Do not bind the counsels of the Lord our God. For God is not as a man that he may be threatened, neither is he as the son of man that he should be wavering. Therefore, let us wait for salvation of him and call upon him to help us. And he will hear our voice if it please him. For there arose none in our age. Neither is there any now in these days, neither tribe, nor family, nor people, nor city among us, which worship gods made with hands as had been aforetime. She tell them, look around, man. We are a different nation than we was when we went in captivity to Babylon. She's saying, ain't nobody serving and bending down to no idols. She's saying in that time. She said, we're not serving those gods like that, those false gods, the Canaanites. And she said, because of that, hey God, for the which cause our fathers were given to the sword and for the spoil and had a great fall before our enemies, but we know none other God than the Most High. Therefore, we trust that he will not despise us nor any of our nation. You see the faith of this woman of God? Don't put no time limit on God. Five days for some water. Man, Moses was in the mount 40 days, 40 nights. No food and no water. That's the type of God we serve. He get you through on no water at all. Be up in there drinking your spit, feeling good. You see? That's when you know you're God. She said, we're not the same people we used to be. We don't bow down to Molech no more. And Diana and Zeus and all the gods of the nations. We serve the most high. Something has got to break. And I believe in our time right now, I'm understand that's us. We might not be what we're supposed to be, but I guarantee you this, 
we ain't serving the gods of the land of Canaan no more. And you can go in the trap house like I see, and he's talking about the most high. You understand what I'm saying? And in that position we in right now, we not perfect, we not right, but where we miss and, and where we fall short, Jesus going to make up what we miss. We in a perfect situation for revival and for him to restore us to where we used to be. Woo! Something's got to break. You see? And so they tell her, Judith, we know you're right, but we already made the oath in front of the people and God. What are we going to do, Judith? So Judith says, okay. Most high done gave me something in my head. I have an idea. I know you done blocked up the city, but open up the gates. Most high done gave me wisdom with the inventions. And in 833, you shall stand this night in the gate, and I will go forth with my waiting woman, and within the days that you have promised to deliver the city to our enemies, the Lord will visit Israel by my hand, Judah said. But inquire not of mine act. Don't you ask me how I'm going to do this. For I will not declare it unto you until the things be finished that I do. She said, send me out the city. And in the armies, you know what I'm saying, they looking out. They, they thinking a whole army coming out the city, a woman coming out. With her handmaid. You see? One woman and her handmaid. Judah. And she told the governors and the elders, she said, I'm not going to tell y'all what I'm going to do. It's top secret. Because if I tell y'all, y'all messing, some things going to get back to the general. I ain't telling y'all nothing. But just when I come back, I'm going to tell you how I got it done. All right. Y'all ready for this? All right. All right. All right. All right. We got a little more time. Look. And she, she prays. Watch 9-7. She prays. Now, have y'all found anything that's not godly in here so far? Anything that's anti-biblical so far. Everything is about the most high. In 9-7, she talks to God. She says, for behold, the Assyrians are multiplied in their power, most high. They are exalted with horse and man. They got horses on us and men on us, God. They glory in their strength of their footmen. They trust in the shield and the spear and the bow and the sling. And know not, watch this, this is a book this is an album. This is a song. She says they trusted in all this stuff, but they know not that thou art the Lord that breaketh the battles. Who the Lord that breaketh the battles. Yeah, they got all this stuff. But you, in the day of battle, you can change everything. You can turn everything around. Make the mighty fall before the weak. And weakness made strong. The Lord that breaketh the battles. The Lord is thy name. Throw down their, their strength in, their, in thy power and bring down their force in thy wrath. For they have purpose to defile thy sanctuary. They want to destroy your temple, Lord, to pollute thy tabernacle where thy glorious name rests and to cast down with sword the horn of thine altar. Behold their pride, God, and send thy wrath upon their heads Give into mine hand, which am a widow, the power that I have conceived. Smite. Break down their stateliness by the hand of a woman, she said. You see? You see? Look at 11. Watch this. Watch 11. For thy power standeth not in the multitude, nor thy might in strong men. For thou art a God of the afflicted, a helper of the oppressed an upholder of the weak, a protector of the forlorn, a savior of them that are without hope. I pray thee, I pray thee, O God of my Father and God of the inheritance of Israel, Lord of the heavens and earth, creator of the waters, king of every creature, hear thou my prayer. This woman of God is going to walk. She go on the wall, boy. I'm telling you, she remind me of Miss Denise up in there, boy. Or Miss Mary, Miss Mary Ross up in there, just praying up in there. Praying the wall down. Remind me of First Lady. Hey, God, just praying the wall down. You see, some trust in horses and some in chariots, but we're going to remember the name of our God. Hey, God. 
the Lord that breaketh the battle. Well, this woman of God goes on a covert, top secret mission into the enemy's camp. She, hallelujah, takes off her widow's garment, the sackcloth. They seen her mourning for her husband for three years and four months. They forgot how she looked dressed. She took off the widow's garment and she dressed herself up. And the book of Judah go into everything that she did. And, it, and, it, and, and when you read it, it looked, sound like us. All the different jewelry she put on and how it says she braided her hair. Hey, God, that, that ain't nothing but a Hebrew woman. You see what I'm saying? She got, she got done up, man. And she walked out them gates. Woo! With the most high behind her. More powerful than a standing army of a thousand men. You see? Through faith. Through faith. In 1019 or 1011, 1011, we get, amen, her going into the enemy's camp. 1011. Thus, they went straight forth in the valley, her and her maid. And the first watch of the Assyrians met her. They had watchers out there, spies, and watching the night, making sure nobody was moving. So they saw her, and they took her and asked her, of what people are thou? And what's comest thou? And what the goal is thou? Go, who are you? Where you going and where you come from? And she said, I am a woman of the Hebrews. Woman of God, wherever you are, say that with me. I am a woman of the Hebrews. You see? And am fled from them, for they shall be given you to be consumed. Now, she's playing a double agent right here. All right? This is war. And things are a little bit different in war, as we see in the book of Joshua, Rahab hiding the men, amen, using a little bit of uh, uh, trickery and sleight of hand and deceit in the times of war, amen. You don't do this in your everyday life is what I'm talking about, all right? And so, hallelujah, just like sometimes in the Bible, like when David played crazy, amen, and uh, in the midst of the Philistine king, Agar. So, so here it is, 13, and she says, I am coming before uh, uh, Holo Furnace, uh, the chief captain of your army, to declare words of truth, and I will show him a way whereby he shall go and win all the hill country without losing the body or life of any one of his men. She said, I want to talk to the general. Look at 14. Now when the men heard her words and beheld her countenance, Oof. They wondered greatly at her beauty. I can hear Mr. Joe up in his saying, mercy. <laughs> and said unto her, all right, they saw her, man, her countenance and her beauty. And they said unto her, thou hast saved thy life and that thou hast hasted to come down to the presence of our Lord. Now therefore come to his tent and some of us shall conduct thee until they have delivered thee. To his hands, and when thou standest before him, be not afraid in thine heart, but show unto him according to thy word, and he will entreat thee well. They say, Well, come on, we're gonna bring you time. You know, they think he they think they blessing him, you know. And 17, then they chose out of them a hundred men. They brought she come to the to the general with a hundred men on to rock, a hundred men to accompany her and her maid, and they brought her to the tent of the general, uh uh Holo uh, Furnace, uh, and then was there a concourse throughout all the camp for her coming was noised among the tents and they came about her as she stood without the tent of the general till they told him of her. They all just wanted to get a look at her and they wondered at her beauty and admired the children of Israel because of her and everyone said to his neighbor, who would despise this people that have among them such women? The boy said, them boy got some women in their house. My God, my, I can hear the woman of God from California. My God, my God, my God. See? And so, hallelujah, she makes it to the tent of the general. All right? And we know our Hebrew women look good. Hey, God, that's why, hey, God, the slave masters was losing their mind. You see? All right, all right. They try to play like the Hebrew woman don't look good. Hey, God, but if you track history, they was putting stuff in England in their dresses to look like them Hebrew women. They were, they were putting stuff in their, in their clothes. They, hey, God, now they have a surgery to look like them Hebrew women. Woo, 
we hear me, you know? Shots in the lip, shots, shots in the hip. They put everything trying to look like. My God. See? Because the Hebrew woman is part of the root. You see? Part of the root. Part of the root. In her, like the other women of color, come forth all the other women. And so she could wear her hair like this one, wear her hair like that one, come out, pow, wear her hair afro, power. You see? And that is who we had before us in Judah. So she goes in and tells them that she can deliver the city. But the general is not worried about the city when he sees Judah. He's only worried about Judah. He ain't worried about the battle. He ain't worried about the war. And I can hear Mr. Tyrone in here saying, yes, 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 Pastor. You see? Woo! So he keep her in the camp with him for a few days, Minister Sam. And a few days pass, and the general invites Judah to a feast. All right? And at the feast, there's a bunch of people partying and cutting up, and he invited her in there, and 12, 16, look what it says. Now Judah came in and sat down. And, and Holofernes, his heart was ravished with her. And his mind was moved. He couldn't keep his mind together. And he desired greatly her company. He wanted to talk with her. But why? For he waited for a time to look, to deceive her from the day that he had seen her. He wanted he wanted to be with her, and he was looking for a way to be with her. Some of the commentators even say that he was so desperate for her that, that if he could get her alone, he would even force her. If he, but he just wanted to be with her because she was so beautiful. You see? And in 20, hey, God, uh, we see that, that, that the general, like the other generals do, the other kings do, it's a party, right? J. Malvo, watch this. Just, just picture. Just be there with me. It's a party, but everybody listens to the general. And when the general say party over, party over. And so everybody music cutting up and the general winking at his men, you know, five minutes, y'all all going to get out of here. Because <laughs> the party was at his place. And so he give them the signal so they all start, you know, playing music, creeping out. They all start creeping out. And his goal is to get himself alone with with Judah, all right? But how many people know, amen, that, hallelujah, all things work together for the good of those who love God and those who call according to his purpose, all right? Because we're going to see here in a minute, Judah want to be alone with him too, all right? And so he's so happy that she's there, he begins to drink. And they began to talk, and he keep drinking, they keep talking, he keep drinking, they keep talking. He get takala, like we say in Louisiana. Sloppy drunk. All right? And in 1220, watch this, and uh, 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 Holo Furnace took great delight in her, her conversation, her company, and he drank much more wine than he had drunk at any time in one day since he was born. <laughs> He drunk the most he ever drunk since the day he was born. You see what I'm saying? The power of a woman of God, of a beautiful woman, to do good or the other. Judith waited until all had left because they was all creeping out. They was all creeping out. She waited till they had left. And like a, a train hired, Hitman, an assassin, all right, for the life of her nation. Because you got to understand what the general was going to do to the people of Yah. He was coming in, and he wasn't going to spare children, woman, man, dog, cat. He was coming in slaying, ripping up, opening uh, pregnant women. They, 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 they did everything when they would come through. So what she did was for the life of her nation and like a hitman, like a trained assassin after he had got drunk and passed himself out on the bed and all of them leave because they're setting up for the general to be alone with Judith 
13, 6. Y'all still up? Then she came to the pillar of his bed, which was at Holofernes' head, and she took down a fascion. That's a, that's a, that's a Middle Eastern sword. You've seen it. It's, it's a beautiful sword, but it's got a little curve on the end of it. And it's short. short. She took out his sword from thence, and she approached to his bed, she took hold of the hair of his head and said, Strengthen me, O Lord God of Israel, this day. And I stopped the verse right there. Because y'all know what she did. She gave that boy a shave, and it was a close shave. She chopped off his head. You see? She took the boy, sword, cut off his head. She put it in a bag, and her and her girl ran off into the night. When she got to the city, I don't know how she made it out the camp. The Most High did it. When she got to the city, they coming up to the city. Judah 13, 11, look what it says. Then said Judah to far off to the watchman at the gate, open, open now the gate. God, even our God is with us to show his power yet in Jerusalem and his forces against the enemy as he had even done this day. She come in the city with the general head. You see, what happens next? Pastor, she tells them the plan of battle for the next day. But they're looking all like, you know, we don't even know who this belonged to. He said, this is how the Lord set everything up, Minister Brian. Watch. Remember the king of Moab that was testifying about Israel to the face of the general that the general got so mad at sent him into the city? The city of Judah. Judah said, bring Achior here because y'all don't look excited about my plan. 13.5. But before you do these things, my plan, call Achior, the Ammonite, that he may see and know him. I think I was calling him a Moabite. The Ammonite, that he may see and know him that despised the house of Israel and that sent him to us as it were to his death. Call Achior the Ammonite here and let him see the person who had sent him into our city as a death sentence. The dude told Achior, next time you see me, it's on. You ain't going to survive next time you see me. All right? And Achior remember that. Watch this in verse 6, 13, 6. Then they called Achior out of the house of Uzziah. And when he was come and saw the head of General Holofernes in a man's hand in the assembly of the people of Israel. Watch this. He fell down on his face and his spirit failed him. You know what that means? He passed out. He said, Ooh. he passed out. All right? Verse 7, but when they had recovered him, they woke him up. When they recovered him, he fell at Judah's feet. And he reverenced her and said, Blessed art thou in all the tabernacles of Judah and in all nations, which here in thy name shall be astonished. Now, therefore, tell me all the things that thou hast done in these days. Then Judah declared unto him, in the midst of the people, all that she had done from the day that she went forth until that hour she spake unto them. And she told him all that happened. And you'll read the book of Judah, and she tell the testimony how she will accomplish all that without sinning against the Most High God and laying with that man. She said, I did all that, and God opened the door, and I didn't even have to give up nothing. I didn't have to do nothing that was, that, that was contrary to the Most High God. It's a beautiful book to read. You see, the Most High set it up. He was drunk. He was alone. Nobody else was there, and we took care of our business. You see? Watch this. And when she had left off speaking, the people shouted with a loud voice and made a joyful noise in their city. She said, okay, now they ready to go to war. You see? Now we're going to read these last little parts and then we're going to get out of here because it's getting late. In 1411, watch what the children of Israel do. They got all these soldiers outside of them. Amen. But these soldiers don't know that the general who would lead the battle that he has fallen in the night. You see? 1411. And as soon as the morning arose, they hanged the head of Holofernes upon the wall. 
All right. Israel put his head on the wall and every man took his weapon and they went forth by bands into the straits of the mountains. But when the Assyrians saw them coming for battle with their weapons, they sent to their leaders, which came to their captains and tribunes and to everyone, their rulers. So they came to hollow furnaces tent and said to him that had the charge of all things, wake and now our Lord. For the slaves have been bold to come down against us to battle, that they may be utterly destroyed. Wake up the general. 14. Then went Bagoas and knocked at the door of the tent, for he thought that he had slept with Judah. But because none answered, he opened it and went into the bedchamber and found him cast upon the floor dead, and his head was taken from him. Therefore he cried with a loud voice, with weeping sign and a mighty cry. He rent his garments. And after he went into the tent where Judith lodged, he went check on Judith. And when he found her not, he leaped out to the people and cried, These slaves have dealt treacherously. One woman of the Hebrews had brought shame upon the house of the king Nebuchadnezzar. For behold, hollow furnace lied upon the ground without a head. 19. When the captain of the Assyrians' heard, uh, army heard these words, they rent their clothes and their minds were wonderfully troubled. And there was a cry and a very great noise throughout the camp. You know, there's a scripture that says, smite the shepherd and the sheep shall what? Scatter. And it not only plays an effect to the people of God, but in every organization, if you destroy the leadership, then the whole organization is going to crumble. All right? 15.1. And when they that were in the tents heard, they were astonished at the thing that was done, and fear and trembling fell upon them, so that there was no man that thus abide in the sight of his neighbor. But rushing out altogether, they did what? They fled into every way of the plain and the hill country. They also that had camped uh, in the mountains round about uh, Bethulah uh, fled away. Then the children of Israel, everyone that was a warrior among them, rushed out upon them, and they had the victory, and they won the battle, and they spoiled the tents, and they came out with riches, and they did it all by the most hands, most, most high's hand through a woman. You see? In weakness, faith will make you strong. You see? I'm not going to keep reading, but uh, the high priest come. And he blesses Judith, tells her that she's going to be remembered. Next verse is in 15. Judith gives all the glory to the Most High uh, in her prayer. Hey, God. And she ends off the statement with this. Uh, all the way down, Brent, if you can go to verse 17 of my last text. Hey, God. All the way to 17. She begins to sing the praise of the Most High. A God, I think it's around 15, 17. A God, I know all of this is good, but we don't have time. But I'm going to read 15, 17. I think it's 15. It says, Woe to the nations that rise up against my kindred. The Lord Almighty would take vengeance on them in the day of judgment and put in fire and worms in their flesh, and they shall fill them and weep forever. Amen. The saints of God, that was the book of Judah. And it's the book, amen, that the writer of Hebrews, according to F.F. F. Bruce, was no doubt thinking about when he wrote that in verse 34, that these people escaped the edge of the sword that was right outside their city. Out of weakness were made strong. A woman of God, a widow woman, went through and destroyed a whole army single-handedly. Waxed valiant in fight. They chased away the enemies. Turn to flight the armies of the aliens. They chased them all the way out of their country. And it all happened because one person believed the most high. I wonder if there's anybody in the nation of Israel amongst our people that will believe God like the writer of Hebrews puts and like Judith. Amen. And I pray that there's somebody in here. Somebody out there watching, because we're going to need you for such a time as this. So we're going to go ahead and pray a little bit. Amen. I'm going to lead you in the sinner's prayer, and, and we're going to get out of here. Father, we just thank you so much for your word and, and your way. We give you praise, O King, for 
uh, the apocryphal books, and we, we thank you for this awesome story of Judith and how it exemplifies, amen, your power, your sovereignty, and your will and your way. Now, Father, I pray that if there's someone out there with insurmountable odds against them, that they would understand that you are the creator God. You are the God that breaks the battle. And I'm praying just thanking that the battle is not ours, but the battle is the Lord's. And we look out and we see the shootings in the streets. We see, hey God, the oppression. We see the lack of compassion. We see all that the enemy is doing through the races of men. And we wonder how, how, God, will this all turn around? I thank you, Father, that through Hebrews and the book of Judith, it all turns around with faith, with us trusting you, with us believing in you. And now, Father, I pray that you would increase the faith of all of your people. I pray that you would add to us faith, that you would strengthen our faith, that we would believe you in these last days. Because we know you're coming, and we know you got many, many wonderful things to do through us, both the men and the women of God. Now, Father, I know that there are some who don't know you. I pray that they'll come to know you, God, that they would surrender to the cross of Calvary and give their sins to you so that you can give them your righteousness, so that we can be viewed through your eyes as sinless, holy, harmless, and undefiled, covered with the imputed righteousness of Christ. In Jesus' name, amen. For all those that's out there, amen, and you might not be saved, you got to understand that the battle is not yours, but it's the Lord's, and the victory belongs to him. Even our salvation, it belongs to him. He does it all. If you're under an old system, a works-based system, you're doing all the work. Therefore, you would get the glory. But that's not the way God intended to save us. He does all the work, so he gets all the glory. The victory belongs to Jesus. It belongs to him. It belongs to Yah. It belongs to Yahweh. The Bible says he did it that way so that no flesh can glory in his presence when we all get in his presence whatever crown whatever accolades we have we'll cast it all down at his feet because by him to him and through him are all things be glory to the most high forever and ever amen and salvation is no different we admit we sinners we believe in the death burial and resurrection of Yahshua Hamashiach, and he saves us based upon our faith. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. If you're ready to believe, if you're ready to be saved and forgiven and rest in the finished work of Messiah, if you're ready to give him all the glory, pray with me right now. Say, Most High God, the victory belongs to you. All the glory is yours. My righteousness is yours. Without you, I am nothing. I can't be forgiven and I won't be saved unless you do all the work. I thank you for the gospel the good news that Yahshua came to save his people from their sins. Now, I admit that I am a sinner, but I believe in the death, burial, and resurrection of my Savior, Yahshua Jesus. Save me now. Forgive me now. Cover me now with your righteousness so that when you look upon me, you see no iniquity. You just see the purchased possession that Yahshua bought with his blood. Write my name 
in the Lamb's book of life. In Yeshua Jesus' name, amen. 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 Victory. 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 Victory belongs to you. Come on, somebody. Victory belongs. Victory belongs. It don't belong to us. To <laughs> you. Hallelujah. The battle is not yours. Victory belongs. My God. To Whatever you're going through. Whatever you're going through, give it to God, because the victory, victory belongs, my God, to you. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Victory belongs, we got it, to him. Just trust him, just trust him. God bless you. May he keep you. May he cause his face to shine upon you. May he be gracious unto you. May he lift up his countenance upon you and bless you with shalom, with peace. In the mighty name of Yahshua HaMashiach, Jesus, our Christ, our Lord, our Messiah. And I pray the book of Judith bless you. Go out and get you an apocrypha and start to read about the history of our people. It's going to build up your faith. It's going to be a great commentary, a great amen. Hallelujah book to read on the side of your Bible, amen. And as the Lord give me breath and show me revelation, hey, God, I'm telling you, I'm just doing my normal study in F.F. F. Bruce, amen. These are the mother people. The mother people reading the apocrypha, but you not. F.F. F. Bruce say, this is Judith right here. And I say, all right. Let's read that book of Judah and pull out some study for the people of the Most High God. Love y'all. Be blessed. Be blessed. Victory belongs to Jesus. Victory belongs to Him. Victory belongs to Jesus. Victory stand against the Lord. No one can and no one will. Who can stand against the King? Yeah, no one can and no one